Is the audio okay? Good. I'm, I'm sort of good. All right, so I have two videos to record. Doing this with 30% battery life. Uh, life isn't easy. Anyways, yeah, so the Forever Verge came out a while ago, and I think I should have just done a reaction to the Kill Count video for the first Purge movie. Uh, the, the prequel movie. Actually, yeah, Purge Beginning, though. Let's call it that. Because most confusing title of all time. There are so many movies like that nowadays where it's like they often have the same name. Kind of like the thing, the the Car the John Carpenter, 1982 Carpenter film, which essentially is a remake of A Thing from Another World. But, you know, hey, it's the version most of us remember. And the Thing 2011 prequel has the same name. I don't know why. Same thing with the Fast and the Furious, with the Fast and the Furious films. Uh, the first one, the original, is called The Fast and the Furious, and then the fourth one is called just Fast and Furious. It's like, ah, uh, it's not as bad as like oversimplifying corporate logos, but it's like, yeah, that's kind of confusing. I, I call it Fast and Furious Four, obviously, because uh, it's easier for me. And yeah. But I have seen the videos on the other three Purge movies, and I never really saw the video on the first Purge. Uh, the Purge Beginnings, I'll have to call it. And, uh, this was pro- Okay, so I guess to sum up my reaction, if you've never seen me talk about the Purge movies, um, sorry, my, my dogs are just always doing stuff. Hold on a second, let me just pause this recording, because- I never catch a goddamn break. Because my mom just needed some help with thinking. Uh, I don't really like to close the door, but I wish we could just stop. Okay, it's, it's, it's good for now. But yeah, I, I have seen... Oh, damn it. Uh, I've already... I've seen the... You know, first movie, I thought it was an okay movie. I just felt like it had... It was a very interesting premise, the idea of crime being legal for like 12 hours. <laughs> during the night is pretty scary. Sorry, you just gotta... I didn't wash my hair today. It's usually messy. And, um, but yeah. It's an idea that got better as the sequels went along. You know, and if I had a proper ranking order, say the Purge Anarchy, Purge Election Year, the original Purge movie, and then at the bottom would be... Right, Anarchy, Election Year... Original, and then at the bottom is somewhere <sighs> the prequel movie, Purge, the first Purge, or Purge Beginnings. I, it's not that I was really excited for it, because I feel like the last movie ended off at a perfect note. I have not seen the Forever Purge yet, but there was so much potential for this movie to be good, and uh, I know these movies are not exactly critical darlings, but. Two and three actually worked, you know, from being the first one being a generic home invasion movie to the sequels becoming much like a John Carpenter Escape from New York vibe, like early John Carpenter. That's what I always look for is like movies that kind of remind me of that John Carpenter we love, like some of the earlier John Carpenter stuff. But yeah, I I did not like the the prequel movie. And it, you also, Marissa Tomei was wasted in this. I love Marissa Tomei. She's a. Damn. Door. Sorry, the door just keeps staying open. I don't know why. And. You know, also, they wasted Marissa Tomei. How dare you? She's an Academy Award winning actress. Really great actress. And she's just in the movie. And the way they did it, all the things, is like. Uh, I feel like it was an unnecessary film, where it would have been better if we had just seen what happened after. I don't really think we needed more after election years. Thing. I liked that it was, wait, it's like, hear about, you know, NFFA, NFFA supporters, you know, uh, causing riots, and then it ends. And I like that it ended ambiguously. Because it, it kind of, uh, Doug Walker said, the ending is kind of clever when you think about it, because it shows that regardless of the political party, 
you know, there's always going to be, you know, a rise. There's always going to be resistance. And, yeah. Yeah, but this one was not a good movie, so let's just get on with this. The first purge kill count. Let's see what James has to say about this. <laughs> Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Denise, and today we're looking at The First Purge, released in 2018 as a prequel to the first three Purge films. The Purge series, of course, centers around the annual holiday in a fictional timeline of the United States where crime is made legal for 12 hours, resulting in lots and lots of murder. The series became increasingly political as it went on, with franchise creator and writer-director of the original trilogy, James DeMonico, exploring how such a law this holiday would affect the disenfranchised of America. The first Purge, by which I mean this movie, not the original Purge film, damn that's confusing, is no exception. It shows how this whole experiment, right from the get-go, was used by the privileged in power to take advantage of those less fortunate. I covered the original Purge trilogy last summer, and the experience still gives me nightmares. Kill counting those bastards took days of frame-by-framing and looking for bodies in the background, and when it was all said and done, Election Year, the third Purge film, unseated the Belko experiment as the new kill count record holder with 116 victims. It's held that title for the past eight months because in the 50 plus movies I've covered since then, not a single one of them has had a higher kill count. Pretty damn impressive. But does that all change today? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's get to the kills. The movie begins with a scary scary dude telling us what he does in his spare time. This insane motherfucker is named Skeletor, and he's being interviewed by a government stooge about the best way to release all the hatred and anger he has inside. Just a fucking purge! All the shit that eats me up! Purge. Interesting term. Yeah, interesting enough for a title card! Red, white, and purge, baby! A news montage shows us the present condition of the US of A, and it's not very good. There's high unemployment, another housing crisis, and just when I thought I could not escape. Yeah, who am I kidding? I'm never gonna escape at blockers. So I'll have to pause here. Yeah. Turns out it wasn't really an ad, it was actually uh the ace the music video for ACDC's Back in Black. Now I'm wish it's because I don't really know what ad is gonna show up. So that's why I prematurely stopped the recording until the ads go away. High unemployment, another another housing crisis, an opioid epidemic? Sucks that that last one's real in our timeline, too. All this turmoil has led to a third party having some unrealistic success. It's the new Founding Fathers of America, who, the movie notes, gets most of their funding from the NRA. That gun money and a healthy dose of both sidesism wins the NFFA the White House, and Milk Toast President Bracken promises a Hold on, I gotta get my water, because I'm pretty thirsty at times. These things can be very long, like hour, an hour long. All right, I'm just gonna put this thing on the door. Ugh. I'm in my pajamas, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, actually, you should. America that he'll make everything okay. Bump on over to Staten Island two days before the experiment, as the purge is currently being called. Instead of the nationwide purge we know from the other films, this first iteration will be restricted to Staten Island as a sort of laboratory of purgeocracy. The government has set up trailers here to conduct more close-up bright white interviews, and these give us all the exposition we need to know. Participants in the experiment will get $5,000 just to stay on Staten Island with a tracking device in their arm, and could make additional money if they engage in further participation. You mean kill someone? If you feel compelled. All these poor people are lined up to partake in what they see as easy money. They don't need to kill anyone or commit any crimes, they can just stay home and make five grand. But some people think this experiment is messed up, which, you know, it is. So there are some lively protests outside the trailers led by activist Naya. Naya is played by Lex Scott Davis, who was Tony Braxton in that One Lifetime movie. And she lives in the nearby Park Hill Towers, a low-income housing project based on the actual Park Hill apartments of Staten Island, which had high crime 
crime in the 80s and 90s, and which is where the Wu-Tang Clan comes from. And I hear they're nothing to fuck with. Naya lives with her brother Isaiah, who is not very happy about the leaky condition of their low-rent apartment. As the protesters chant, do not purge, CNN's Van Jones, playing himself, interviews NFFA Chief of Staff Arlo Sabian, a kind of Sean Spicer-looking dude who defends the purge alongside behavioral scientist Dr. May Updale, played by Aunt May Parker, Marissa Tomei. I still can't believe they made Aunt May so hot. Dr. Updale- Yeah, I remember that was a thing. When it was an- I still keep saying it, but I remember when it was announced that Marissa Tomei was cast as Aunt May. That's enough. The internet went nuts. Like, every Spider-Man fan was like, No, how dare you? You know, Aunt May's supposed to be an old woman and Marissa Tomei's too. It's like, I don't care. As long as she does a good enough job, I don't give a shit. Plus, I love Marissa Tomei. Also, she- How old is she, actually? I gotta look it up here. Do I have it? Damn internet. Oh, no, I am not changing servers. Not changing servers, goddamn. It's probably some. This always happens during recordings, is like the internet like uh, shits out on me at the last minute. Damn it. Let me just check. Yeah, uh, the the internet crapped out on me again. I have to pause the recording. <sighs> why, God, why? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I had to wait for, like, yeah, the internet to come back. The, the internet always does this to me. It, it always craps out. Ugh, good. I'm checking battery life. Eight, you know what? I, I'm not even waiting until it warns me. I'm just going to put it on. That way I'll watch with better lighting on my laptop. Ugh. Oh, wait. It's because I forgot to put the, the battery server, the battery saver on. Turn on. Sorry, I, I hate doing this all the time. Ugh. All right. Let me see. I since I have it back here, or not? Is it back or is it not? Connect. I dang it. All right, yeah, it's back on. All right. All right, so let me... I'm looking up a lot of stuff. All right, Marissa Tomei, how old is she? She is 56 years old, and she's still... She she looks younger than that, honestly. God. Yeah, I mean, I freaking love Marissa Tomei. She's a talented actress. Alex Scott Davis. Uh, Timmy Braxton, Unbreak My Heart. I'm also looking up Tony Braxton's filmography for the hell of it. Uh, Superfly and Son of the... Se oh, Sweet Girl. Uh, the, the new Jason Momoa movie that's coming out. Alright, I'm gonna put it on the cast list. In case, uh... Dr. May Updale, the architect. I wonder who this, um... What was the name of the guy? I'll look it up later. But first, came up with the experiment, but promises that it isn't political, it's just a way to help people vent their emotions. The protests are observed by local drug kingpin Dimitri, a cool, calm, and collected Stringer Bell type, whose allies include three loyal lieutenants and a trio of retired OGs. And we do three stooges on our best day. Mo, Larry, Jerry Kerr. D calls a business meeting and tells his crew they're not allowed to participate in the purge because it's... Oh, he was uh, Daniel King on Insecure, uh, from on, on the HBO show Insecure, which also had uh, Issa Rae. Oh, and the photograph. Uh, the photograph I've heard is, I haven't seen it yet, but I, I, I've heard it's pretty good. I mean, I have to know for sure. Damn it, I took it off the page.
It's too much a liability for him and his drug trade. One dude, capital A, whines that Dimitri should allow them to observe the holiday as they please. But this chick Blaze shuts down that insubordination in a jiffy. Dimitri's drug trade includes corners like this one, which is one chessboard short of being straight out the wire. Isaiah is secretly working here in order to afford better living conditions. And it's an unenviable entry-level position, since it means having to deal with crazy customers like Skeletor. You know what? I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't be saying such mean things about this dude. I might just be judging a book by its cup. Oh, he's got a razor in his mouth. After slashing Isaiah in the neck with it, he runs off teeing as the corner crew unsuccessfully shoots after him. Naya comes home and sees her brother's neck wound, so she heads to Dee's office to yell at and hit him. Turns out these two used to date before he got into the whole drug dealing business. Dee says he had no idea that Isaiah was working his corners, and invites both of the siblings to stay with him during the purge so he can keep them safe. Naya appears Sorry, to consider it. I played Isaiah. Sorry. Jo Joyvan Wade. Keep pausing every time. Yeah, this was his first major film. Ah, he was in two episodes of Doctor Who. Uh, he's in uh, Doom Patrol as Cyborg. He plays Cyborg on Doom Patrol. So, yeah. I've heard some middling things. Yeah, I'm looking at the actors. Only a few of them have IMDb pages. So, just to give you a uh, patch Derrick. The hell is Patch Derrick? I just got a weird tweet notification. No. All right, I'm looking at the what this actor did. Uh. So, let's see, actor, all right. So he's done two episodes of Succession, uh, The Loudest Voice, which I think The Loudest Voice, well, I, I know that one, what is this? Oh, on Roger Ailes, the founder of Fox News. That was it, I remember that. I remember it because I remember seeing, um... Seth MacFarlane in the series. He's really good in it, too, as well. Yeah. Until D also says that he'll take care of Skeletor, and that drives her away from him again because she ain't down with this gangsta life he leads. We all have to make choices in life to heal or to hurt, and you chose the latter. Damn, D. Looks like it's gonna take a lot to unbreak her heart. Placed on leave from his corner job, Isaiah turns to purge participation for income, and his orientation includes a purger starter kit that contains the blue Batesia flowers that have been a symbol of purge support since that very first movie with Ethan Hawke and Queen Lita Heedy. I don't forget to buy your blue Batesias. Show your support for this important evening. Although I I think they forgot about them entirely in Anarchy and Election Year. Oh well. Isaiah's starter kit also includes some contact lenses that serve a dual function. They're recording devices, and they look fucking awesome. It's like Minority Report on your eyeball, son! An hour before the first purge begins, the bridges to and from the island are closed, and people are out with their Armageddon signs. Some Staten Islanders, like this Lady Louisa, played by Dexter's Lauren Velez, and her daughter Selena, take refuge inside a church. Louisa, played by Dexter's Lauren Velez, and her daughter Selena. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going back to the, the page on, on the movie. First bird. Uh, Lauren Valais. Yeah, um, Maria LaGuerta on Dexter, New York Undercover. Oh, has a twin sister. All right, yeah. Ah, oh, she was uh, in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse as well. And uh, she's now in uh, Transformers Rise of the Beast, which I'm actually excited for that because they have a good director in Stephen Cable Jr. Hopefully, if it's as good as Bumblebee, I'll, uh, I'm fine. That who, who plays the daughter, but yeah. Who's the actor who... Ah, oh, forget it. If I, I can look it up on IMDb later take refuge inside a church. These people aren't sticking around to commit crimes, they just want that government money. $5,000 to stay? 
It's life changing for us. Naya is staying to help out around the church, and Isaiah lies to her that he's safe off the island, even though in reality, he's sticking around to go all He Man on Skeletor. Did you say Skeletor? Everyone from the sinners to the saints watches on TV as President Bracken counts down to that classic Purge emergency broadcast, which concludes with the by now iconic Purge sirens. <laughs> Damn, I love that scary ass noise. Oh, also fun fact, this movie doesn't have Edwin Hodge, who played the stranger slash Dwayne Dante Bishop in the first three movies. Because he's not around, Cindy Robinson, voice of the Purge announcement, is now the only actor to be in every Purge movie so far. May God be with you all. Isaiah heads out to look for Skeletor and witnesses a bevy of sights, including glowy eyed people creepily staring at him through their windows, and my personal favorite of this movie's side characters, these two women listening to Daz band and pushing around a shopping cart full of baby dolls. Damn, these ladies are loving it. Turns out their baby dolls are explosives that they line the street with, and they nearly end up purging Isaiah just for kicks. Sadly, that's all we get of these gals, but they are a hoot. Other, more consequential antagonists are also prepped for purging. Capital A, that purge hungry dealer in Dimitri's crew, gives a perspiring speech and pumps his crew up with rhetoric and recreational drugs. Meanwhile, Skeletor, who's a huge Dream Warriors fan, does doesn't need a crew, and instead psychs himself up all on his own. Skeletor's purge is on. He has I'm gonna say it. No offense to the actor who played him. Mentally he's scary, but in actuality he's just kind of that annoying guy you're like... Like even... Uh, who was the actor who played him? Because once again, I'm not trying to bash the actor. I didn't really care much for him. He was, he's not as interesting as Big Daddy was. Alright. Rotimi Paul. Timmy Paul. What was he on? Uh, uh, what? Really? Oh, he was in the movie uh, Maple Maple Maplethorpe. So he's yeah before this, if I'm not mistaken. A look at the life of photographer Robert Ma Maplethorpe. Yeah. It's the Robert Mablethorpe autobiography biography film from his rise in the 1970s to his ultimate to his untimely death in 1989, which also happened to star Matt Smith, interestingly enough. Yeah, once again, no, it's just he's just a boring villain overall, but the, the way they shot him like with the longer lenses kind of gave me that Tony Scott vibe. I, I really enjoy that, though. Heads out to where this one dude is trying to rob an ATM with impunity and secures the first kill of the purge and the kill count by stabbing the guy with his knife. You see me, NFFA? Yeah, you're uh, kind of hard to miss, man. You're 6'2 with head scars and glowing eyes. But so far, Skeletor is the only person interested in murder. A pawn shop does get robbed, but besides that, most people are just chilling and not killing. They're even having raves, as the NFFA discovers. Isaiah runs into his friend slash corner manager Kels, and the two of them go to one of these purge parties, which looks like a block party I would have gone to in college, erroneously thinking I was cool enough to be there. You can't hang with no cheetah ladies, college James, what you thinking? This party's vibe is about to get harsh though, cause here comes Skeletor pretending to be Fred Krueger some more. <laughs> A mermaid lady just can't help herself from docking against Skeletor. Not sure what the appeal is there, especially since all he gives her in return is a stab to the stomach. It's the first of three kills here that he dances his way to in the crowd. The next is this Toon Yards looking woman he stabs in the back, can't even say sorry to bother you to her skelly, and the last is this super normal looking dude who just loves block parties I guess. He gets stabbed in the stomach a whole bunch of times, and it's his murder that gets noticed by the other party goers. They all run off as Skeletor yells after them, except for Isaiah who steps out to enact his revenge. But the young blood doesn't have the metal to go through with it, and Skeletor knocks the gun out of his hands, scaring the kid away and taunting after him. I'm the knight Isaiah! I'm gonna find you! Isaiah takes refuge inside a building that's full of more glowy-eyed ghouls, but he manages to hide from them in a back room. Yeah, dude, maybe close your ring light eyes when you're hiding from people in the dark. Or, yeah, just take those contacts out. News of Skeletor's killing spree spreads to Sabian and Dr. Updale. She gets excited about psychological releases or some shit, but Sabian ain't ready to call it a success until the Park Hill Towers get involved. And right now, they're still quiet. Skeletor's kill cam is also aired on the news, and 
incidents seen by the Staten Islanders taking sanctuary, including Nia's friend Dolores, who just a little bit ago was having fun sneaking swigs at the sermon. It tastes like old man ass. <laughs> Don't ask me how to know. Way to ruin a good time, Skeletor. Isaiah calls up Naya and confesses that he's still on Staten Island, so she heads out to help him into the purge night that's starting to get rowdier with stuff like street arson and sewer snares. That trap leads Naya to getting sexually assaulted by a nasty-looking dude with a baby face mask. But thankfully, she pepper sprays him and runs away, shouting overt but accurate political references while she does. This was probably the, my favorite part of the movie, was that line. This, yeah. Pussy grabbing mother. <laughs> yeah. Him and runs away, shouting overt but accurate political references while she does. She arrives at where Isaiah is hiding, but gets attacked by. You know, when that's the best line in the movie, you've officially peaked. Skeletor, who begins to slice into her neck before Isaiah runs out and stabs Skelly in the back, messing him up enough to allow the siblings to escape. Throughout all this, Dimitri has been lying low, but still can't escape danger since he almost gets assassinated by a pair of call girls who are named Elsa and Anna in an apparent reference to Arendelle royalty. Wait, who's Arendelle? They try their darndest to kill him, but after they fail, D learns that they were sent there by Capital A. So later, when the rebellious underling meets with the ladies and tries to claim his crown, he and his cronies get surrounded by Dimitri and his loyalists. You can't purge me, man. I'll purge you. Dimitri puts the insurrection down quickly by putting the cap into capital A. He also has his crew shoot down the lowercase letters who were with A, giving us a total of three new kills for the count. As for Anna and Elsa, he lets them live but banishes them from the island. You know, snuff out their torches, not their lives. Sabian is still all whiny about how people aren't purging at predicted levels, even though Dr. Updale tells him, tough titties, that's science, bitch. The MFA put a lot of faith into this evening, if it's deemed ineffective, the entire regime could be judged as a failure. I told you that science does not obey the laws of politics. He goes off and makes a phone call, which might just have something to do with the people Naya and Isaiah see on their way back to the church, riding around flying nationalist flags. This is when the first purge really becomes a purge movie. And you know what that means. Frame by frame kill counting! While Updale watches a news report about how purgers are starting to wear masks, we get six kills to add. There are three people lying on the street back there, and a fourth person hung up and getting beaten to death. I'm assuming these four are all dead anyway, while the fifth victim is definitely dead, having bled out on the sidewalk, and a sixth one is seen being dragged down the street, also probably dead. Dimitri is on his way home with his lieutenant seven and seven when they're hit by a flaming ice cream truck. Hope all the grenadine didn't burn up, I need that for my ice cream treats. <laughs> D watches as armed men shoot down some dude at the back of an SUV, giving us another kill for the count, but the real increase in numbers here will come at the hands of Dimitri himself. First he bre breaks one of these dudes' necks, and after okay. grabbing He was easily my favorite character in this movie, I will say, because he's a badass. The guy's gone, he quickly disposes of the other three guys there with some downright John Wicky inefficiency. As he calls for backup, Naya and Isaiah get back to the church, only to find a very difficult to watch scene. One that's sadly reminiscent of the real life Charleston church shooting of 2015. Very evocative imagery here by Gerard McMurray, who took over directing duties from James DeMonico for this fourth purge film. Looks like the only survivors here are Luisa and Selena, and although they say there are more dead inside the church, I can't count what I can't see, so I'll leave it at the three we see clearly on the steps. Don't worry though, I can add 18 more kills from some monitor footage. There's one person on fire in that bottom left screen, one dude who runs into a bullet bottom center, eight people run over by an SUV in the upper right monitor there, one person being dragged to their death in the lower left here, another person falling victim to a drive-by upper right monitor here, and finally six people being executed against a brick wall there. I can't discern enough from the other images to know if there are any more kills in them. But I'm doing the best I can here, people, okay? Dr. Updale is confused about this sudden influx of violence from these late arrival gangs, so she uses security cameras to track where they came from. She finds their spawn point and realizes that they're not local residents, they're mercenaries, who are now on their way to crowded low-income areas. And they know where those are because Sabian has been feeding them tracking device info. You're making it look like people are participating because there wasn't enough purging. Sabian reluctantly fesses 
glasses up and says that there are just too many people to take care of in the country. So the NFFA is trying to save Social Security through legalized murder. I guess it was either this or taxes, and boy, do people hate taxes. Updale expresses regret over the experiment and tells Sabian not to do this, but he says it's too late for that and leaves her in the custody of his goons. Dimitri and his crew also figure out that the dudes he killed Sorry about pausing. Both were mercenaries. Like Black Water back in the days. On Merc Radio, WKLL, they hear about a quarter that's been hit. And it turns out that eight of these dudes were gunned down there. As we see in this long shot, that makes my job counting bodies much easier. Among the eight victims there is Kels, D's sergeant on the corner that Isaiah worked. I think he was probably at, like, a Bodie-esque level. You know, like season four Bodie. Naya and co. are hiding from colorful clansmen and trying to run back to the towers as we get a montage that gives us more kills. First, there's a dude doing a cool fire stunt who I'm just assuming didn't survive the flames. Man, I love fire stunts. And then, another nearly dozen kills when we see a bunch of cops on a baseball diamond killing one dude before a wide shot shows us ten other victims on the field. Play ball! They make it back to Naya and Isaiah's apartment, where Luisa makes Naya promise that she'll protect Selena no matter what. Obviously, Luisa. Anything for Salinas. Their party gets more festive after Dolores shows up, unharmed but in need of Pepto-Bismol. Then I get the bubble guts, tried to run home. Oh, but it gets better, cause I shit on myself a little bit when I was on my way home. Hey, that's how bubble guts be sometimes. Dimitri and his crew raid their armory of guns and explosives, figuring that they have no choice but to fight back against the government's mercenaries hired to kill them. Our neighborhood is under siege, gentlemen, from a government who doesn't give a shit about any of us. They head out to reclaim their neighborhood from evil fucks like Sabian, who's currently making sure that Dr. Updale is taken care of. Kind of a nice thematic parallel to how Dimitri the criminal talked about doing the same thing earlier. Dimitri intercepts a Merc report about an armed resistance, so they head to the site where Klansmen are attacking those three OGs we met earlier. During the shootout, the Klansmen shoot and kill two women and then two dudes who are in there fighting with the three kings. A fifth body, a dude, is also seen on the floor as the guys try to take cover. After the kings run out of ammo, their approaching attackers are stopped by a, oh no, a smoke grenade? How am I supposed to count these kills if I can't even see them? Guess I'll do my best and forget the rest. And my best counting determines that 13 evil clansmen bastards get killed by Dimitri and his gang here. It happens through a variety of means, mostly shooting and stylized smoky shots, but there's also a fair amount of throat slitting, stabbing, torso slitting. I mean, honestly, it's a grab bag of kills. And it all happens in only 30 30 seconds. Hot damn! D and his crew come out of the fog like ghost pirates and rearm the old timers before hearing on the radio that the mercenary teams are headed to the Park Hill Towers. Back to the ghost pirate ship we go. They get there and see armored trucks headed to the towers, but they don't see the drones approaching them overhead and targeting them all as armed enemies. The only one who does notice is Lorenzo, one of D's lieutenants, who shoves his boss underneath an SUV for safety and then is promptly killed by a hail of bullets. D watches from beneath the vehicle as the rest of his crew is put down, including Blaze and five nameless members of the entourage. Seven and Seven survives long enough to encourage Dee onward and give him a deathbed fist bump, but I'm assuming he dies shortly after Dimitri heads out. Naya and the others see the militia storming their towers and decide to bunker down while Dimitri calls her up with some intel from the ground. They're gonna move from floor to floor, killing as many as they can, okay? You're on the 14th floor, so you got time. Wait, floor to floor killing? Oh no! Yeah! <laughs> I feel so bad for James right now. <laughs> Like, what a, damn it. I can imagine these movies are... Uh, these racistly clad soldiers called the Smileys and their leather gimp pimp daddy General Smiley are about to make my job miserable as they tactically murder everybody they see. Dimitri gets in on the first floor and finds immediate evidence of their efficiency when he sees nine people murdered in the hallway. Some dudes, some ladies, some unknowns, while the Smileys kill another three on a higher floor, putting an end to this resistance in residence. Yo, Purge movies are fucked up, dude. I don't know how I'd count off-screen kills where the only thing we see is the mercenary shooting, so our next additions to the list are three smileys themselves after they come across Dimitri in a stairwell. He shoots one in a doorway and kicks off a fantastic action sequence with some awesome fight choreography by stunt coordinator Hank Amos. I love the long takes tracking this crazy fight. D kills a second mercenary by shooting him in the chest with a rifle, and he finishes off the last- That's one thing I will say is that this fight scene, 
any scene with Dimitri was like through this third act is like the best thing in the movie. Uh, Hank game. And um, I'll actually look it up later. All right, let me let me look it up. See what Hank Amos has done. I think he was the stunt coordinator for Falcon Winter Soldier. Hank Amos. Damn it. Yeah, Google microphone does not understand a goddamn thing I say. Hank Amos. All right. Let's see what he's done. Actually, I want to check out all the movies he's done as a stunt performer. All right, second unit director here. Oh, he also directed the second unit on this movie, so he's the second unit director on it. Stunts. All right, here it is. Stunts. Um. So yeah, uh, he also did the hunt. The hunt was a it was a pretty decent film. Uh. Yeah, a lot of uh, superhero films as well. Uh, yeah, I don't have time to list them. Yeah, also was the stunt coordinator on election year. And, uh, yeah. Uh, inst oh, and Purge Anarchy. So he's, did he do the first one? That's, no, he's been actually the stunt coordinator from Anarchy, election year, and this one. And did the second unit on this. I don't think he did it for the newest one. Last dude who's wearing a blackface inspired face mask by choking him to death yeah. with his bare hands. Fuck all my neighborhoods. Haha, <laughs> this fucker looks like he'd be a member of the brood. As the mercenaries move throughout the tower, we see another nine bodies in another hallway. I wish they'd make it clear what floor these dudes were on because it would add to the dramatic tension as they go higher and higher in the tower. All we know is that Dimitri is lower than them. Wait, hold up, go back, pause. God damn it, there are a bunch of blurry bodies back there. What is that, six? Six, I think. Could I get a rat? focus here? Come the fuck on! Oh, and even though I see three more bodies in the background by a bicycle here, turns out those are the same three victims we saw get gunned down earlier. Continuity error? I don't know, but I won't put them on the count again since they'd be duplicates. Gotta love kill count in the purge. D finds a power box and shuts that shit down, which allows him to get the jump on a group of smileys and kill six of them. The first two by slitting their throats with a knife between flashes of an alarm light, and the remaining four by stealing a gun and shooting them down with it. After he takes off, off, though, we see that the Leather Daddy has survived. We've got a problem. Yeah, someone's in for a paddling. We finally get that tension building I wanted earlier when flashes show that the Merc Squad is getting closer and closer to the 14th floor. Well, Dimitri is, what, is he ahead of them now? I'm actually not sure. Naya and the people in her apartment have barricaded themselves in the bedroom with only a single gun between them. So when the Mercs come a no knocking, they have to take them down by shooting them in the legs and then stabbing them to death with kitchen knives, which I Isaiah and Dolores do with bigger. Damn, I bet she ain't even thinking of her bubble guts now. Uh, also, that is. Uh, oh God, I just noticed this. Isaiah and Dolores. Hold on, James. Okay, that is some pretty. I okay. I'm pretty sure they did have squibs for certain blood shots, but that is. How do I slow down the frame rate? Playback speed. Point twenty five. Look at that. That is pretty bad CG blood. That's always... I hate seeing CG squibs from time to time because... Yeah, it's like the CG, some of the CG squibs in, in the fourth Rambo movie are not good. But, hey, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's because also these movies are made with very... Like, $10 million dollars. At best, and so it's like they don't have enough money for the the blood or stuff like that. It turns out practical effects are unfortunately expensive, but the fact that studios do not want to spend that much money on practical effects is stupid to me. Why am I taking risks? All right, back unmute. Back to the video. For bubble guts now. Another merc hears the commotion and heads back towards their room, but after he gets inside, he's killed with a headshot by an off-screen Dimitri. Coming in clutch there, D. Dolores delivers a painfully bad line about their reunited ex-lovers. Little Miss Naya and Dimitri Simba, the big fucking dog of Park Hill. And then they prepare for a final stand, a daddy stand. Daddy and his boys show up and shoot into the bedroom for a little while before breaking out the big gun, a freaking rocket launch. Before they can use it though, they're interrupted by Skeletor, who's here out of nowhere with a Skello hello. Mother 
motherfuckers! After that first guy, Skeletor seems to kill three more smileys with his knife, but I think they double filmed the action here, because all three of the dudes he stabs appear to be alive again when they turn around and shoot him. So I won't count them as dead right now, we'll only count the first smiley and Skeletor himself at this uh, point. But Finally, I was happy when they finally killed off the character, because it's like, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, if it were me, I'd be like, I hated you. And then I just double tap to make sure. But don't worry, those other mercs get their just desserts after Naya throws an explosive at their feet. D takes a gut shot from General Smiley, but still hits the explosive with a bullet. So now I'll count the remaining mercs in that room as dead. There's General Smiley Leather Dad for sure, and then I think he had five Smiley Boys with him. We can count them in that shot from Skeletor's perspective a second ago. D and Naya survived the explosion thanks to a fireproof mattress, and the others are okay because they were inside a fireproof closet. Okay, surviving explosion? is easy, I guess. D is injured, but not critically, and although Nia and Isaiah's apartment is now even shittier than before, a blaring siren confirms that the Staten Island experiment has concluded. It's over. That could have been a better name for this movie, the Staten Island experiment. Not as similar as Belko experiment. It would have been a better title than the first Purge to, you know, not confuse audiences. I would have preferred that, the Staten Island experiment. They all go outside where there are other survivors being helped, and Dimitri makes a promise to fight for their rights, even though some of these people are already getting back to everyday life. The movie ends with that dope-ass Kendrick Lamar song and a mid-credits press conference from Sabian singing praises of the purge. We're considering a nationwide purge, uh, as the people are now calling it. Uh, as early as next year. Will the birth of the Purge take the crown for most kills? Let's find out at the numbers. Right after I read about the Staten Island experiment, because it offers a solution to the pain in my lower back and the never-ending late fees. So that sounds pretty good. It's an investment in my future. Yeah, I think, uh, this sounds pretty good. Paid for by the <laughs> NFFA. I think I might do this, so I'm gonna look this up online. Sorry about that. It paused again. Fine, real fast. Then we'll count those numbers. 133 people died in the first purge, meaning yes, my friends, election year's reign is over because the first purge is the deepest. Baby, I know. The victims included, I think, 60 men, 12 women, and 61 of unknown gender, thanks to all those background bodies. And with a runtime of 97 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every... 43.76 seconds? Holy shit! I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the three mercs who Dimitri yes. killed in the stairwell, simply because of the awesome way that whole scene was filmed. Props to D's actor, Elan Noel. He really brought it in this movie. Doll Machete for lamest kill could be literally anyone else. So, uh, here, hallway victim number 12. Yeah, those legs right there, I guess. And that's it! The first Purge came out in 2018 and was followed by a 10 episode season of television on USA. I haven't seen that yet, but it got renewed for a second season, so that's good? I don't know. Let me know what you think about it. I'll have another episode for you next week, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching the first Purge Kill Count. I want to thank a couple of patrons like Mitchell Link, Liam Stewart, Janine Van Meter, and Michael Baldwin. Kinda hoping they never make another Purge movie, just so I don't have to kill count all the fucking bodies in the background, man. But now I'm done with it, and I don't have to do that again. Also, that first Purge brochure came from Hollywood Horror Nights at Universal Studios. Alright, thanks everybody. Be good people. Man, that, yeah, I'm now, now thinking of the John Tron meme, it was, it was, it's the, after John did the, uh, goop episode, and he got reading actual Gwyneth Paltrow for coats, and he read the Weinstein one, John is like, that one didn't age quite so well, <laughs> it didn't age quite so well, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to, I, I hate to bring be the bearer of bad news, James. There's a fifth one, which I haven't seen, but I do want to check out. But yeah, I've actually not seen the TV show yet. I might check it out. I may not. Actually, I want to look up the people involved with this. Um... Uh... 
right. So I'm looking at it. I think I got to go to IMDb because sometimes IMDb is it, it helps you provide better information than say um Wikipedia because I noticed that the page for a lot of the things on there was not working out well. Let me check. Double check. Uh, yeah, there's no wiki page for the cinematographer or the film's editor or even the film's director Gerard McMurray. But there is a Page for James DeMonico. Yeah. Gerard McMurray, yeah. From what I know, they've actually hired a different director named Everard or Gout. Alright. Gotta go down. Alright. Huh. Alright. Uh, film editor Jim Page, cinematographer Anastas N. Michos. I do know who that cinematographer is. Uh, I think it's a Greek name, actually. So if I go to translate, see what it says. Oh, shit. Sorry, you weren't supposed to see it. My VPN is crazy sometimes. I hate my VPN sometimes. Sorry, I just can't wait for everything. It's just... Can't have one page open too much. Alright, so let's see. Anastas Michos... No, born in the USA, actually. But is he... Is he... I think he's Greek. He, he was born to Greek parents. Uh, Italian... Greek... How do you pronounce it? Anastas. So let me see how you pronounce it. Anastas. 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 Yes, yeah, sort of. I, I, I almost got it correctly. Anastas. I'm looking at all the films he shot here. So let's see what he's he shot over the years. Uh, oh, Man on the Moon. Uh, that was the movie based on, um, uh, what was the name? I know what the movie is. I've seen it. Um, Man on the Moon. Uh, Andy. What was the name of that? All right. Man on the Moon. All right. Let's see. Uh, Mona Lisa Smile. That was a pretty good film. The Forgotten. Perfect Stranger. Um... What else? Oh, uh, that's interesting. He shot a lot. He's very versatile from, like, all right, The First Purge and apparently all three Kissing Booth movies. The weirdest thing to come out of this guy's filmography. So he's a very versatile cinematographer. And let's see, camera. He has more credit in uh, camera and electrical. Um, so let's see. Oh, second unit for uh, Motherless Brooklyn. Um, oh, he also did additional photography on the Purge election year. And uh, he started off as a camera operator. This is interesting. So films he's worked on as a camera operator. Instinct, Stepmom, What Dreams May Come, Private Parts, Absolute Power. That's a really good film. The People vs. Larry Flint, Interview with the Vampire, Quiz Show, With Honors. Um, The Paper, Six Degrees of Separation, What's Eating Gilbert Grape, The Age of Innocence, Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, The Doors, um, Born on the Fourth of July, uh, and Eddie Murphy Raw, and VFX, what did he do? Oh, Cable Cam for Fright Night Part 2, uh, Panaglide is operator for Fright Night Part 2. Panda Glide, I think, was the system. What was the, the, the name of the Man on the Moon? The, the comedian that Jim, Car that Jim Carrey plays is based on Andy Kaufman. That that was it. The life of uh, Andy Kaufman. And here it is. Jim Page, the film's editor. Let's see what he's worked on. Uh, damn it. This is why the app is at least slightly better, because I can see what I'm looking Editorial department. 
So, uh, oh, uh, assistant editor on the pilot episode of The Sopranos, additional editor for Taking Lives, worked on The Majestic, The Salton Sea, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, edited, and uh, Firewall, Disturbia, Eagle Eye, I Am Number Four, Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters, Scat's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse, uh, Triple X Return of Xander Cage, um, uh, okay. And the film's director, Gerard McCurry. <clears throat> Alright, so let's see what he's d done, uh, mostly. So his first movie was Burning Sands. And he worked as, okay, he worked as associate producer for Fruitvale Station. Does that mean he was location manager or something? Additional crew? Cinematographer? Yeah, uh, associate producer. Uh, Burning Sands. I actually want to go back to Anastas Michos here. So, uh, let's see. Kissing Booth. Uh, The Empty Man. That's actually a really good film. I really did like The Empty Man. And his latest films will be The Kissing Booth 3, which from what I know is shot back to back with 2, and Once Upon a Time in Staten Island. Let's see, uh, I think I've heard of this movie. Described as a coming-of-age family drama set in the summer of 1982 on... Oh, James DeMonico's directing this, and they've got quite a cast on this. Uh, Frank Grillo, Naomi Watts, Bobby Cannavale. Okay. You had my curiosity, now you have my attention. I mean, James DeMonico going... I can wait long enough, all right, you assholes? Sorry, I was talking to the... I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, audience. Burning Sands. Yeah, the, a Netflix movie. That's interesting. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was fun to watch. Didn't really, don't really, like I said, I, I'm not a huge fan of uh, the, the prequel movie, The First Purge. But, it was interesting to see this kill count. Because, why not? I'm still trying to wait for like, John Deems DeMonico to, like, load up. Because, yeah, the internet is angry with me right now. Or maybe it's God. I don't know. God, I've been 51 minutes in here. I'm just checking the frame rate. Yeah, I'm sorry that I'm not talking much. It's just, it's just I can't stop it. The the frame rate is too automatic. I hate that. I hate that shit. Every time. All right, so let's see what he's done as a director, James DeMonica. I just, I'm really curious. Little New York, and then the first three Purge films, and then yeah, what is he? Oh, oh yeah, he wrote uh the movie Jack. Not not a good movie though. The Negotiator, actually pretty good. Uh, the remake of Assault on Precinct 13, and then, yeah. And now he's come back to directing after a long time. But he actually stuck on as the writer for the first... I feel like maybe that's why I wasn't as big a fan of the first Purge. I haven't seen the Forever Purge, so I don't know how to feel about it. But, um... Sorry, I have no water left. I am interested in checking it out. All right. What was this movie? Little New York. Okay, so maybe it ain't worth it. Is it like a drama or something? Yeah. Oh, Ethan Hawke. Vincent D'Onofrio. Oh, Seymour Cassell. I love that guy. Alright, I'm ending the video here. This was the Dead Meat video for The First Purge 2018. Hill count. And damn, that was a higher. I think the highest number was actually election year, and now it's like... I don't think any other movie will ever top it that I know of. Yeah, Steely Dan music video. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll leave a link to the original video down below. as well as a link to Dead Meat, James's channel. Five, five million subscribers. Congratulations, man. And a link to my Instagram. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. If you subscribe, hit the bell to stay notified. That's beat, everyone. Take care.